So here's a question for all of you. I see a good number of people there and I have to ask you a very important question. For those of you who were here at the last session, number 52, two days ago, did anybody record the session or capture the session externally? I have to know that. I don't care if you did it because they're all free, but did anybody save the session? Okay, I see somebody named Pax, P-A-X, saved the session. Now I am happy because at least I could contact Pax and ask them to send it to me somehow. And you are a lifesaver, Pax Lattimore, because I'm going to be contacting you or you could email me and we could get the session over. I'm very, very happy now. Good. I see a couple people saved part of it. Somebody saved it on tape deck too. So I'm really thrilled. Yeah. Pat, uh, Pax Lattimore saved it on tape deck. So somehow I'll be able to uh, uh, get it from you. Right, Pax? Is that true? I will somehow be able to get that tape from you. Is that true? Please tell me yes. And I'll be, okay, good, good. No more about that. That was the only announcement. Uh, if you remember, uh, we started the discussion on the GI tract and did about half or more than half of the esophagus. So we'll finish the esophagus today and move down the GI tract. Hopefully we'll do all of the stomach and uh, somewhere along the line, we might even be able to get into the intestines, small and large intestine today, but I don't know because it's really, really a huge, huge chapter. Also, I wanted to tell you today is ABBA day. So all of the music that we hear today, like the one we started out with and all of them at the break and all of them at the end, are going to be from my favorite European uh, group, even more favorite than this other European group called the Beatles. Now, uh, we'll figure out, we'll contact Pax and we'll figure out how to get that thing uh, saved somehow, so don't worry. Okay, I'm happy now. We did the test, we did the announcements, uh, we told you where we are, and I think we could probably just go right into the material now. If you remember, and uh, I see a lot of familiar names, I don't keep track of who comes to class or not because I don't care. But I see a lot of familiar names uh, on many, many sessions, and then I just quickly look at them and uh, hope that you come back somewhere along the line. We were talking about the GI tract, and if you remember, we slid all the way down to the discussion of reflux and GERD and started to discuss the concept of Barrett's esophagus. Now, I want you to think of a concept. We made it very, very clear that the dividing line for a hiatal hernia was the diaphragm. And we said the presence of stomach above the diaphragm is a hiatal hernia. That's easy. Now we're going to draw a new dividing line. And we're going to call it the squamocolumnar junction. If you remember, the esophagus is entirely squamous, and the stomach is entirely columnar, glandular. Okay? So the definition of Barrett's esophagus now is the presence of a glandular or mucus or goblet cells in the esophageal mucosa. That's the diagnostic feature. Of course, uh, it's not only a microscopic diagnosis, but it's also a endoscopic diagnosis because the GI guy sees it all the time. And what you normally see as a nice shiny white plaquish squamous mucosa now looks a little bit mucoid and glandular. So it's a very easy diagnosis for the GI doctor. The reason why Barrett's esophagus is very, very important when you see gastric or intestinalized glandular mucosa replacing squamous mucosa, you then have a situation which makes it predisposed to atypia. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to go into cancer. It also doesn't mean it's going to become atypical, but it means that if an adenocarcinoma does develop, it's probably going to be developed in the setting of Barrett's esophagus. So think of Barrett's esophagus as something that breaches 
the GE junction. Now, here we go. And before I start showing you the Barrett's, you could tell that this whitish area, which doesn't look mucinous, isquamous, and you could tell this red, pinkish, uh, gucky, mucousy stuff is columnar. So there's your GE junction. And if you remember, when we looked at the uh, laceration of this stomach and we showed you a normal GE junction, the first thing you probably realize is that the squamocolumnar or GE junction, I might use the term interchangeably, is not a perfectly straight line. It's irregular, it's jagged. There may even be a little uh, island of squamous out there and it's not a perfectly well-defined line. This is an area where we had a tear. That's not important to what we're looking at now. What we wanna look at now is this irregular coastline between the pinker, more mucus appearing, uh, gastric or columnar or mucus, mucosa, and this stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium of the distal stomach. It's not a straight line. However, the concept of Barrett's is that even though it's not a perfectly straight coastline, when you have the presence of this gastric or intestinalized or mucus or goblet cells completely over and into the squamous area, it may be a large area, it may be a few patches, uh, then that's the definition of Barrett's esophagus. Uh, the simplest way to think of Barrett's esophagus is to think of it as a metaplasia, because that's exactly what it is. Do you remember when we talked about the various types of metaplasia or the substitution of one type of normal tissue for another type of normal tissue? We almost always talked about squamous metaplasia. We said that whenever a, a columnar mucosa uh, like the cervix is a squamocolumnar junction, or the anorectal area is a squamocolumnar junction. Or, uh, and here's our third classical squamocolumnar junction. Well, what we said is that when the uh, glandular area, like in the cervix or in the anorectal area, is subjected to trauma, it metaplases to become squamous. Well, we've got the same concept here, only it's going the other way. Think about it. If you have reflux, and many of the patients with GERD or reflux flux acid into the squamous mucosa, the squamous mucosa is not equipped to handle acid simply because it doesn't have any mucus cells. You know, mucus is somewhat alkaline and it neutralizes acid. But if you're refluxing stomach acid into the esophagus, there's no way to really physiologically handle that unless the squamous mucosa now becomes mucus. Okay, that's the concept. So here is a squamocolumnar junction. And in all honesty, I don't know if this is a normal one or not, but you can tell that there's looks like there's an area up here above the general line that may look a little bit pinker, like the stomach does, or it may be largely pink. So if you think about this arrow as being where the squamocolumnar junction should be, you are now seeing that it has been pushed up. And in addition to that, even above the squamocolumnar junction, wherever it really is, you see some more mucus stuff. So this is the point of view of the pathologist uh, doing the autopsy. And here's the point of view of a endoscopist who is looking at an esophagus and he expects to see this whitish material or squamous all the way down below the diaphragm, you know, to the cardia of the stomach. And instead, it's not white. It's completely replaced by pink. And you know that when you do a microscopic exam on the pink, it's going to be glandular. It's going to be mucus. There may be goblet cells. And when you do a microscopic exam, on this part of the esophageal mucosa, you know it's gonna be squamous because it looks squamous. So here we go, here's some more pictures. This is what the esophagus mucosa should look like. Stratified, squamous, non-keratinized, and of course, no skin appendages because it's not skin. It's just non-stratified squamous. Then you have your various muscle layers and connective tissue underneath. Here's a portion of uh, submucosal esophageal mucus gland 
but in Beard's esophagus, the mucus is now being made by the surface epithelium. You see that? You're thinking, well, why isn't this a stomach? Well, the reason why it's a stomach is because it doesn't have the lamina propria of the stomach. This is an esophagus. And if you don't believe me, then just remember, all of the muscle here is the kind of muscle you see in an esophagus. So whenever you are looking at an esophagus, but it really looks like stomach, especially the mucosal aspect, you know you're dealing with Barrett's esophagus. Here's some more uh, glandular epithelium from the Barrett's, okay? Now, the thing we're going to be talking about is that the presence of gastric epithelium in the esophagus is not by itself precancerous. However, there is a statistical relationship and possibility that sometimes some of this gastric or intestinalized or mucus mucosa may become atypical. Okay, it doesn't have to, but it may be. And if it becomes atypical, it doesn't mean it has to turn into cancer, but sometimes it does. So let's define this properly. Most of the adenocarcinomas of the esophagus are in the lower part because that's where the glandular epithelium is metaplased. Okay, but not all Barrett's turn into adenocarcinoma in the stomach. In fact, it's a relatively low percentage. The, uh, the reason why I don't want to give you the exact number is because, as you might think, this uh, percentage increases with time. So if you double the amount of years, you can probably double the amount of probability. So here we go. Barrett's esophagus, intestinalized or gastrocytes or mucus-producing cells, is at risk for glandular dysplasia. Now, when the endoscopist looks at the Barrett's epithelium or Barrett's mucosa in the esophagus, he'll do little biopsies and he'll send it to us. And of course, if it's squamous, we say, well, it doesn't look like Barrett's. But if it's gastric and he says it's from the esophagus, then it is Barrett's. And if we see uh, goblet cells, then it's absolutely Barrett's if it's from the esophagus. Now, if this patient develops an adenocarcinoma, most likely there was previously existing Barrett's esophagus, but Barrett's itself is not considered pre-malignant. Okay, here's a uh, picture of a biopsy of an esophagus, which does not show columnar mucosa. It shows glandular mucosa. And I think I'm uh, being heard very well right now. So I'm gonna pop out the uh, uh, question window and I'm gonna ask you, can you see uh, some cells in this glandular mucosa, which you think are a little darker, are a little bit bigger and a, a little bit more irregular than others? For example, might this cell be in mitosis? Do you think this might be a bigger, darker cell, perhaps in mitosis, maybe that one as well? Do you think some of these cells are bigger? They're not quite as uh, normal as some of these, or perhaps there. They have to be careful because some of these nuclei may be overlapping, so you can't call everything that looks big and dark an atypical cell. You've got to focus up and down on your microscope and make sure you're, you're not dealing with overlapping nuclei. So that's the criteria for which we tell the GI doctor that this is not only Barrett's, but it may be atypical. And that means this patient is going to be watched very, very carefully by the GI doctor and followed up at more intervals for the uh, possible um, uh, development of severe glandular atypia, which of course we call adenocarcinoma in situ. Okay, we're done with the concept of Barrett's. Very important. Let's talk about the things that can inflame the esophagus. Esophagus, non keratinized stratified squamous mucosa. It can become inflamed by a lot of bugs and a lot of things. Uh, people that uh, are always near the top of the list are, is the concept of strictures. Uh, people that ingest Drano or lie very frequently have very, very destructive changes to their esophagus because that's the first mucosa that it hits. And with uh, 
the normal inflammatory and fibrotic process. Very important strictures can develop within that esophagus and even obstructive strictures. So that's a common, well, it's not a common, it's a classical, but not common cause. Alcohol in itself is a significant irritant to the squamous mucosa of the esophagus. So are extremely hot drinks, whether alcohol or not, hot coffee, hot water. Much of the chemotherapy patients receive uh, are very, very potentially destructive to the GI mucosa, including the esophagus. So that's always at the top of the list. And probably the three most common bugs, uh, two of which are viral and one of which is fungal, uh, is also very much on the list. Uh, a candida esophagitis is not only a classical feature of a severely immunocompromised patients, but it used to make the difference as to whether a HIV positive patient was still HIV positive or full-blown AIDS, so to speak, was the presence of a candida esophagitis. Herpes simplex can infect the stratified squamous mucosa of the esophagus in the same exact way it infects the stratified squamous mucosa of the skin or oral cavity or things we talked about in earlier chapters. CMV is also very popular. So let's take a look at this esophagitis and I want to ask you a question. For those of you that were here in our discussion of oral cavity and GI, we showed the baby with the candida or the uh, monilia or thrush we said that the uh, exudate along the oral cavity looked white and soft and almost like you could peel it off. So my question to you is, does this look the same now in the esophagus? Yeah, it's a whitish uh, plaque-like exudate. And it looks like you could peel or scrape it off. If it's more severe, it could cause a greater amount of destruction and a thicker amount, but generally it's limited more or less, at least in the earlier stages. And this is classical candida esophagitis. You know, every GI doc could look at this picture and in less than half a second know the diagnosis, even if he didn't look at these little stained hyphae with a PAS stain in the exudate that was along the mucosa here. Okay, let's look at another interesting thing. And here's my question to you. Do you remember when we looked at herpes before uh, of the skin or the oral cavity and we said there was a test called a ZANC, T-Z-A-N-C-K test, in which you scrape an ulcerated area, like here, here's an ulcerated area in the esophagus here. Here it might not be quite so ulcerated, but here it's ulcerated and secondarily infected. And here's some, you know, little vesicular-like lesions as well. Not at all looking like candida. But let's say you look at this under a microscope, even as a scrape or as a biopsy, and you saw a lot of cells with red, intranuclear inclusions. In fact, they're, they're much too big to just be nucleoli. Well, these are classical zinc type cells, red intranuclear inclusions in squamous cells of vesicular lesions in stratified squamous mucosa, whether it's skin, whether it's oral cavity or whether it's esophagus is herpes simplex. Okay, I know you knew that because we talked about it several times. Now, let's see if you're really listening hard though. What would you think if these uh, cells, rather than having red intranuclear inclusions, were more basophilic or they had large basophilic intranuclear inclusions? What would you think of that? I know somebody's gonna get it, uh, especially for those of you who have heard me uh, talk about this disease. Well, remember, we said that CMV is the only common disease I could think of, viral disease, that causes basophilic intranuclear inclusions in the cells that it infects. And interestingly enough, both HI, I'm sorry, both HSV and CMV are in the family of herpes virus, aren't they? Okay, so somebody got CMV right. Let's move on a little bit further now to what we always discuss at last in any organ or system are tumors. And uh, I'm very happy to say that when it comes to the esophagus, the classification of tumors is incredibly simple because 
Uh, when you visualize the esophagus in your mind, you know that we have squamous mucosa. We know that we have perhaps some glandular mucus glands in the submucosa. We know we have smooth muscle. We know we have fat. We know we have some fibrous connective tissue. So therefore, if you could think of benign or malignant proliferations of all these types of cells, you have just visualized the entire gamut of all possible tumors of the esophagus. So what's one of the most common tumors? Well, let me ask you this. What's probably the thickest amount of substance in the wall? It's smooth muscle, isn't it? Well, probably a lyomyoma of the smooth muscle is the most common. Could these sometimes be malignant? Of course they can be. Now, if you had a papillary type proliferation of the squamous mucosa, do you think you could probably call it, and it looked benign? Do you think you call it a fibrovascular, probably squamous polyp? Yes, you can. If a herpes virus proliferated this and then had the classical features of coilocytosis and things we will talk about later, do you think that condylomas of the squamous mucosa caused by HKG could also be classified as a tumor, benign tumor? Yeah. What about this fat here? If the fat proliferated in a benign or malignant fashion, you think you call that a lipoma or lipo liposarcoma, respectively? Yeah. Or here, let's just say there was some type of nonspecific injury to this esophagus and an inflammatory process was set up. And as part of that inflammatory process, there was neovascularization and ingrowth of vessels like we talk about in organizing inflammation or granulation tissue. Do you think you would call that a tumor? Well, I don't know if you'd call it a tumor, but it might be palpable as a lump. So in that sense, it's a tumor, but these are called pseudotumors. So this pretty much covers all of the possibilities. Now, here is the key question. And I mentioned this before, but I want to have somebody or two or three people tell me the correct answer. Let's say that you had an adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. Here's my first question. Do you think it would more likely occur in the upper esophagus or lower esophagus? Absolutely, you're all getting that right. Everybody is. Now, here's the second important question. If you had an adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, do you think it would arise from these little mucus uh, submucosal glands? Or do you think it most likely would arise from squamous mucosa that has been metaplased as Barrett's esophagus. Okay, well, absolutely. You all got the general uh, drill, and I'm very happy for that. So let's go into the single most common malignancy of the esophagus, and that's a squamous carcinoma because most of the epithelium is squamous. Uh, it's been linked to things like tobacco, believe it or not, alcohol, uh, certain foods uh, like uh, that have nitrates and nitrosamines have been indicted. The beetle nut has been indicted that much in the same way it causes cancer of the squamous mucosa of the oral cavity. And uh, also uh, fungi in certain foods, you know, decaying foods will produce nitrosamines at all. So what are the big causes? Nitrates, nitrosamines, beetle, tobacco, alcohol. Now, here's the question. And I hope you get it right. And I'm going to have to be asking you this again. Do you think an esophagitis in itself, for any reason, is premalignant? Well, I'm seeing a yes, but I'm seeing mostly no's. And it's, the answer is no. But I, I want to clarify that. And the, the inflammation in itself is not premalignant. But if you remember the concept, and uh, when we talked about cancer as having both initiators and promoters. Well, very often uh, in a esophagitis, there may be increased mucosal or epithelial turnover due to a hyperplastic effect. And that would be considered to be a promoter. So in itself, esophagitis is not premalignant, but uh, promotion or increased mucosal turnover is part of the promotion concept of carcinogenesis. Here's a nice squamous carcinoma. If you looked here, you could see that it almost looks like a squamous 
normal squamous. In fact, it is. I wish we could go higher, but you could see as you're going towards the surface, the cells are getting flatter. Uh, and then probably if you look at some of the mucosa here way on the left, you're saying, well, you know, it doesn't look like it's maturing. It's a little darker. Even though you can't see the cells, you can see that the maturation pattern from uh, basal to squamous is lost. Maturation pattern here is lost. And if you had a hard time deciding whether this piece of mucosa on the right was malignant or not, or severely dysplastic or not, you don't have to worry anymore because look, here's some invasive carcinoma. This is, could not possibly be a geometric effect. When you see this type of epithelium completely surrounded by esophageal connective tissue, you can with great accuracy diagnose infiltrating squamous cell carcinoma. And as you know, uh, like in the oral cavity, the uh, general rule is normal epithelium, perhaps hyperplastic or dysplastic epithelium, severe dysplasia would be regarded as the same concept as pre-invasive or carcinoma in situ. And of course, once it infiltrates, it is then potentially metastasizable because the submucosa is very rich in blood vessels and lymphatics and so forth. Uh, here is a uh, example of dysplasia. Now, I don't think anybody in the world could ever possibly call this cancer or even carcinoma in situ. Uh, maybe somebody would if they were a little bit uh, hesitant or worried that the malpractice attorneys are going to hire somebody from John Hopkins that are calling it malignant. They might be pushed into calling this in situ. But look, there is a maturation pattern from the base, which is more basal or columnar, flattening out towards a more flat or squamous. This is not uh, carcinoma in situ. This is dysplasia. So... Here are the questions. Would you call this dysplasia? Yes. Second question, could this develop into a squamous cell carcinoma? Yes. The question is, do they all or does it have to? No. And of course, that's a time-related factor too, isn't it? A uh, dysplastic mucosa, if it stays this way or progresses, ultimately would be expected to not only be eventually in situ or more severe, but eventually infiltrate as well. Now, here's the, here is the big question. I want you to all get it right because nobody seems to really want to believe this, but you know in your heart it's true, especially in the cervix and in other squamal columnar areas like the anal rectal area. And here's our third uh, squamous area. So here's a question. Do you think that there have been cases of dysplasia like this that have spontaneously regressed? Absolutely. Why that happens, I don't know. It's generally not a common thing, and the fear is that you can't bet your patient's life on it. That's the whole thing. When you see something like this, you have to assume it's not going to go away. And you know, once it's cancer, it never goes away. But this dysplastic this area, it perhaps, if it's viral induced, perhaps, uh, it may spontaneously regress. If it is in the direct path to carcinogenesis, then you wouldn't expect it to regress. But you don't want to bet your patient's life. Here's an esophagus, an esophagogram, a barium swallow. And we're seeing a pretty nice general uniform caliber to the upper portion of the esophagus. And then you see a significant narrowing of that barium river, and you see irregular margins. So I think this is a really good example. And even if you weren't an expert radiologist, I think you could probably show this to anybody, and they would say, yeah, it looks like there's something obstructing significantly that esophagus. And uh, in this case, it's a large cancer. Um, could this person... Uh, wind up vomiting if there was complete obstruction? Absolutely, because it has no place to go. It looks like this is very, very significantly obstructed, and almost certainly this patient would be symptomatic. Okay, I think you can believe that. A true squamous cell carcinoma, if you call this mucosa on the left normal, and a very nice, precise basement membrane 
and some little fibroepithelial pegs feeding it. And then all of a sudden, you have uh, maturation that doesn't happen in the mucosa and complete infiltration of squamous structures in the underlying connective tissue. So we go from normal mucosa. Now, if you were looking at only this part of the field, you might be wondering, gee, is this squamous mucosa just very abnormal or, or, or could it possibly be cancer? You, know, you don't have to worry about that agonizing decision because when you see this stuff here infiltrating, your mind is already made up. In fact, can I also remind you of something? This infiltrating part of the tumor here actually doesn't look as bad as the in situ stuff over here. Isn't that interesting? Somebody said, is moderate dysplasia and carcinoma in situ the same thing? The answer is absolutely not. It's only severe dysplasia that has the same status as carcinoma in situ. Okay, let's talk about another type of cancer now, adenocarcinoma. So if you were to ask the average GI doctor, what are the 10 things that are related to adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, which is cheaper in the lower part, but it doesn't have to be. He'd probably say Barrett's were the first nine. And then he might say, well, maybe it could possibly come from those uh, either heterotopic gastric mucosa or, or heterotopic pancreas mucosa, or perhaps those little submucosal glands. I guess that's possible, and maybe it's been reported, although I don't know how it could be proven. But the fact is, uh, to make things really simple, think as uh, just about all of the adenocarcinomas of the esophagus as we, resulting from previously existing Barrett's. And you know what the process is. We did this with squamous. Let's do it with adeno now. You have normal squamous epithelium, and you could have an esophagitis secondary to Barrett's. Now you've gone from squamous to adeno. Uh, it doesn't have to progress, but if it does, that glandular epithelium could become more atypical, uh, and then it could progress to an infiltrating glandular neoplasm. Those are the general steps. No matter what the genetics is, no matter what the biochemistry is, no matter what the mutations are, this is what it looks like to your eyeballs in the progression from normal cells to cancer cells. Okay. Let me ask you another question. Now, as long as you're, getting, you're, you're so smart today, let me ask you another question. Here's another cancer of the esophagus. Here's the gross picture on the left and the microscopic picture on the right. And of course, you already know from the right picture that these are glandular looking structures. So you know, already know this adenocarcinoma. Okay, but here's the key question. What is this nice, smooth, normal, white uh, surface here? I'll give you three choices, cancer, normal squamous, or normal ad, uh, glandular. Yes, yeah, normal squamous. You all got that right. Now, here's the tumor. You know it's a tumor because it's popping up. It's polytoid. But look at the surface of it. The surface of it is yucky. It's mucinous. So if you were to guess with your great experience now as to whether this cancer of the esophagus was squamous or adeno, even before you looked at it under the microscope. Could you get the feeling it's probably adeno? Okay, good. Uh, can I ask another question at this point? Because I got one little bleep here. Is everybody hearing me well? Okay, I'm happy. I don't hear any uh, problems. I get a massive amount of yeses. So here we go. We're done with the discussion of cancers of the... Uh, esophagus. But, you know, remember all of those different histologic structures, you know, fat, smooth muscle, these can all be uh, proliferated as well in a benign or malignant fashion. Now, have I ever seen a liposarcoma or a leiomyosarcoma of the esophagus in my life? No, but you know they've been reported because that's where the tissues are and that's where they could arise from. So we're done with the esophagus. Let's see what time it is. Uh, I might have to pop the window back in here. I think we still got good time. Yeah, 
Let's talk about the stomach now. We're moving down the GI tract. The uh, things that we'll talk about in stomach now are very analogous to what we talked about with esophagus. We're going to review a little bit the normal anatomy and histo and physio. We're going to talk about general pathologic concepts. And you know that the general pathologic concepts are always degeneration, inflammation, and tumor. But then there's always this little thing called congenital, which doesn't quite fit in. So this is generally a spectrum of things that we're talking about. And let's start on our trip through the stomach now. You know this stomach uh, has a cardia, which is the portion that interfaces with the esophagus. You know the part that goes along or underneath the diaphragm is called the fundus. You know that the body of the stomach, the single greatest part, is the only part that makes acid. And then when you get distal into the antrum and pylorus, we are no longer making acid, but we're neutralizing acid. So here, let me give you a really interesting concept here. If the body of the stomach is the only part that makes acid, then it's such a powerful acid and such a low pH that you have to have protection of that acid, both proximal as well as distal. So that's why in the cardia, in the fundus of the stomach, it's largely mucus producing or acid neutralizing epithelium. Whereas in the antrum, in the pylorus, it's also acid neutralizing epithelium. So control of acid is probably the single biggest function of the stomach after making of the acid. You know, you have the greater and lesser curvatures. You've seen it, you've held it, you looked at the blood supply. The normal stomach holds about, let's say one to three liters, okay? Uh, they could be distended to as much as not five, six, seven, nine. You know, after that, you're thinking it might rupture, even if it's a big person. You know that there are extensions of the submucosa called rugae, which help increase the surface area, just like the extensions of the submucosa of the small bowel are called plicae, just like the extensions of the large bowel are called haustrae. This is all just a geometric trick that nature has used to increase surface area. You know that the generalized uh, innervation of the stomach is vagus for acid production and sympathetic as a general check on that. You know 100% of the veins of the stomach are the portal circulation. And I wanna show you an interesting thing about the blood supply because the su blood supply of the stomach is always like very, very hard to do. Even if you're digging those little uh, celiac axis out, you always are trying to look for the little branches. Here, let's make it real, real easy for you. Even though there is a massive amount of variation in of the celiac axis, you know, and it's n almost never clearly, you know, the three branches and then those branches all go here. There's so many variations and it's almost never classical. But the one thing you could remember is that all three branches of the celiac axis supply the stomach with blood. So if you go to the uh, gastro, uh, I'm sorry, if you go to the common hepatic, you know, before you got the artery going to the liver, you got the gastro duodenal, and the right gastric not only supplies the lesser curvature, but also the greater curvature, usually as a right gastroepiploic or right uh, gastroomental. Uh, Okay, the left gastric supplies the left portion of the stomach, and that's both along the, uh, usually along the lesser curvature. And also the branches of the splenic artery will send short gastrics into the uh, superior portions of the stomach. And they'll also split off a nice uh, left gastroepiploic or left gastro or mental, depending on what terminology you want to use. So let's make it very, very simple. Uh, all branches of the celiac axis eventually supply the stomach and they're all appropriately named, even though you've probably spent a hell of a hard time finding them all in the anatomy lab. Here's the histology. Now you know that in the stomach and in the uh, large bowel, you do not have villi, but you basically have a flat mucosa into which these pits, these gastric pits go into gastric glands. And that's the general scheme for both the 
stomach and the small intestine, I'm sorry, the large intestine. Whereas in the small intestine, you have actual villi, which are papillary-like projections. Here you have your mucosa. Here you have the connective tissue called the lamina propria. Here you have little lymphoid patches, not only in the lamina propria, but often in the submucosa as well. Here's all your vessels, lymphatic, artery, vein, very, very rich in the submucosa. And because the stomach does not contract as easily and simply as a simple tubular structure like an intestine, there are generally three layers of muscle, and they don't always go in perfectly uh, crossing directions. For example, the inner layers, the oblique, and then you have a general circular layer in the middle, and then you have a longitudinal sort of on the outside. Whereas when you're in the intestines, you basically have two layers, but in that stomach, you have that additional third layer called the oblique. Okay, that's the general histology. Now here's the real histology. Let's make this very simple. You know this is squamous. You know that this is glandular. You don't see any gastric pits or, you know, chief and parietal cells, you know this is the squamo-columnar junction, or if you prefer, the gastroesophageal junction. Now, let me ask you this. If this is the esophageal gastro junction, where the hell is the lower esophageal sphincter? Wouldn't you expect kind of a thickening of the muscle at this point if it's a sphincter? Well, no, thank you. That's the correct answer. It's more of a physiologic sphincter rather than an actual knob like you have in the pyloric area. And that's why reflux is so common because you don't have a real valve here. You just have a physiologic valve. Okay, here's another part of the stomach. And this is the middle part. This is the only part, the body, that produces the acid. And you can see on the top, you have 100% mucus protecting from the acid. And then in the gastric pits, we have these cheap cells and we have the parietal cells. If you remember, the parietal cells, the acid producing cells, always look like fried eggs. And the chief cells, not only generally try to keep these parietal cells under control, but they also secrete the pepsinogen uh, are more of the darker cells. So this is a classical appearance for chief cells, which is the fried eggs. I'm sorry, parietal cells, which is the fried eggs, and the chief cells, which look like normal, more purpler epithelium. I guess you could say that the cytoplasma is red or acetophilic because it's making the acid. That might not be 100% true, but it's interesting way of remembering it. So here we go. Here's another part of the stomach now. And in this part, you have a gastric type of uh, epithelium in general. It's starting to become a little bit papillary though, isn't it? And not only is it starting to become truly papillary, like you see over here, but you have a whole bunch of submucosal glands. Now you have some more mucus glands protecting the acid as well. And in addition, whereas in the upper sphincter of the stomach, which is the lower esophageal sphincter, there was no thickening of the muscle. Look at this. There's a thickening of the muscle. It looks like it's about tenfold. So this is the true pyloric sphincter. So, you know, this is the pyloric area leading in from the antrum. And the submucosal glands of the duodenum are the only parts of the entire GI tract that has normal submucosal glands. Okay. Um, a little review of the physio. I think in general, you know that you know what the parietal cells make. We talked about it. The chief cells uh, make pepsinogen, okay, which is very close to pepsin. They're just a few uh, amino acids more, but they're the precursors to pepsin. They're protein digesting enzymes. The mucus cells make mucus simply because you have to keep these parietal cells under control, not only in the area of the body, but in the portions of the stomach. Uh, below and above the body as well. The mucus cells also make a little bit of the pepsinogen as well, but not as much as the cheap cells. Okay, you know that the uh, enteroendocrine cells make a wide variety of things. Histamine, you know, is big. Somatostatin is big. And endothelin is big. 
Endothelin is a powerful vasoconstrictor. Uh, histamine is a powerful vasodilator. We talked about that several times. Somatostatin is, uh, oh, I guess it's, uh, I, I it actually took the precise definition from Leaky because it's kind of complicated. Uh, somatostatin goes by a variety, wide variety of names, but it's a polypeptide that regulates the endocrine system and affects neurotransmission. It has a really good name because if it's called somatostatin, you think it would be regulating growth uh, of other uh, hormones, and it absolutely does. So those are your general both mucosal cells as, your, as well as your enteroendocrine cells. That's the epithelial component then of, of gastric cells. Acid production um, is uh, buffered by mucus, not only from the mucus cells and a little bit from the sheep cells, but also as, you know, the bicarbonate uh, pump as part of your uh, hemo, uh, homeostasis with the acid production your general epithelial barriers, and your blood flow. And, you know, prostaglandin E is a substance that not only decreases acid production, secreted usually by the endothelial cells, but it also increases mucus production as well. So that's two ways in which prostaglandin E and also I uh, regulate acid production. Let's talk about real diseases now. We'll see what time it is. It's... Uh, Probably about time to take a break. Let me just uh, talk a little bit about uh, congenital diseases that will take our break. Uh, there's a lot of common things like, for example, ectopic pancreas is extremely common. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of you out there have a little bit of ectopic pancreas. Pancreas loves to go everywhere except the pancreas. You can see it in the bowel, the small bowel, the large bowel. Oh, you can see it in the esophagus. We talked about that. You can see it in the stomach as well. A little bit of uh, ectopic pancreas is very, very common. It's usually not uh, uh, symptomatic at all, okay? But if a surgeon is in your stomach and he sees a little uh, nodule on your stomach, he doesn't know that it's just a little bit of pancreas. So frequently they pick this off and they ask us, what is it? We say, don't worry, it's just normal pancreas tissue. You can also have ectopic gastric mucosa, going to the pancreas, just like you've got ectopic pancreas going to the stomach. That's not as common as ectopic pancreas, but it's not rare either. We talked about hernias and the different things that causes it. But the one thing we didn't mention too much is that you can have a congenital diaphragmatic hernia as well. And that's usually not due to gastric over distension like most of the sliding ones are, but this is due of the failure to diaphragm to close all the way. And it's not rare, but you would imagine if you have an embryologic failure of the diaphragm to close, you could have a very, very large amount of stomach above the diaphragm. We talked about pulmonary sequestering, remembering both that the uh, uh, lower esophagus uh, and lungs are all part of the foregut. You can have little uh, remnants of pulmonary tissue in the region of the stomach, but they don't look like pulmonary tissue because there's no connection with any air uh, route. So you would never think it was uh, a lung, but it is. It's just a little foregut remnant. These are, are all embryologic errors. And after our break, we'll talk about the number one congenital gastric disease. And we'll do that in about 10 minutes because I wanted to play three more ABBA songs now. But because we had a little bit of an uh, audio problem at the beginning, I have to ask this question again. Are you hearing me well now, perfectly well, pretty much? Okay. And the second question, and I've asked you this the other day, too. Uh, were the audio problems minimal? Do anybody think that there was a large period where you didn't hear me at all? Okay. I thought they were minimal, too. I don't know why, but when I'm at home, I don't have these little anxieties. So let's do three ABBA songs and come back and finish the stomach and maybe more, but I doubt it. Here we go, folks. 
We're back. That was the ABBA middle. Those were the three ABBA break songs. We started you out with ABBA, and you, as you can guess, we're probably going to like to have ABBA as a spectacular finale as well. Uh, only a couple things popped into my mind during the break, besides getting more coffee. Uh, I discovered that the person who thought that they didn't, or that they might have recorded it, didn't. So I'm going to ask the question again to everybody. If there's anybody out there that thinks they may possibly have the recording or recorded the last session, number 52, the one on ENT Lab and the beginning of GI, please contact me. In fact, I'll give you an A for the course. How about that for a sweet name, Kitty? If you give me the recording from the last session, I'll write you a spectacular letter of recommendation as being a girl. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, I thought of one other little question to ask you. Is the audio now just as good as it usually is in Chicago? Good. Uh, and the second question is, uh, how good is your video? Can, can you tell me what this little word is right here that my arrow is pointing to? It's very tiny. So if you can read it, then we're, we're really cooking. Okay, you can see it. You know it says Chikatita. And John, why don't you email me after class and we'll figure out how to get that recording. I really, really appreciate it. So let's go on with the uh, show here and uh, finish up our uh, hopefully stomach. We talked about the congenital diseases, except for the number one most common one, which is present in an amazingly high percentage of one in 500 or 0.2%, and that's pyloric stenosis. Uh, one of the most common uh, stomach disorders of babies 
it's due to an overgrowth or hyperplasia of the smooth muscle of the pyloric area. Think of it as a huge sphincter. Now, as you know from your anatomy experience, when you poked your finger, you know, at the through the antrum and into the pyloric region, in a normal adult, that was a very, very, very thin muscular uh, opening there. Think of it as being twice as big. In fact, very often, perhaps uh, resulting in obstruction of, of gastric uh, outlet. And therefore, these babies may very much present with uh, vomiting. Uh, the good news is, is that pyloric stenosis, the congenital version, <clears throat> is usually very, very, very responsive to just splitting that muscle and making it uh, bigger. Uh, in the acquired form of pyloric stenosis, of course, which is not known congenital disease, is usually secondary to a lot of fibrosis and scarring in the pyloric area. And that's usually secondary to advanced ulcer disease, where there's a lot of ulceration, inflammation, fibrosis, and can also, in some cases, lead to a very significant stenosis at all, not due to hyperplastic muscle, but due to uh, fibrosis secondary to the inflammation. Okay, let's talk about the number one nonspecific generalized gastric disease, <clears throat> gastritis. And as you might have guessed, we said that when you have acute inflammatory cells in gastric, gastric mucosa or gastric anything, that could very uh, correctly be diagnosed as acute gastritis. Now, clinically, acute gastritis <clears throat> is more characterized by bleeding rather than neutrophils, but usually it has both pathologically. A chronic gastritis could be a uh, continuation of an acute gastritis. There's usually no bleeding clinically with chronic gastritis. And as you might guess, the chief inflammatory cell would not be a neutrophil. It'd probably more likely be a lymphocyte or a macrophage. So that follows the pathologic rule there. But remember, the difference between acute and chronic gastritis clinically uh, is the presence of blood. That's the general thing. You can have an autoimmune gastritis. In fact, we mentioned this a couple of times before. You can have antibodies against your own gastric mucosa, against your own intrinsic factor. And that would result in the inadequate absorption or uh, that would result in the improper uh, metabolism of vitamin B12 by intrinsic factor and ultimately uh, a pernicious or megaloblastic or macrocytic type of anemia. Uh, the other types of gastritis are amazingly related to the type of histologic picture. Now, even though there are clinical syndromes called eosinophilic, allergic, lymphocytic, granulomatous, and they may fit certain uh, scenarios, look at, they all follow pathologic criteria. So eosinophilic gastritis, eosinophils are very, very common. In allergic gastritis, eosinophils may also be very, very common. Lymphocytic gastritis, well, you know what the main cell is there. Could a severe whopping lymphocytic gastritis possibly be confused with a lymphoma? Well, if the lymphocytes were widespread and not the F. Could a granulomatous gastritis be characterized by our classical granulomas? And last but not least, the stomach, as well as the uh, intestines, are frequently the sites of graft versus host reactions, particularly in patients that have had bone marrow transplants so in a bone marrow transplant where you might have your graft or bone marrow uh, could ultimately wind up attacking other parts of the body. And the stomach is a great place as well as the uh, intestines as well. Here's the yellow sheet, which means it's a general list of the more specific and etiologic causes of gastritis. It's in yellow because this is the kind of thing you should generally know if you don't uh, memorize it. You should just think that all this stuff is logical, I hope. Acute hemorrhagic gastritis, presence of blood. Okay, we're not going to say what causes that right now, but let's just say it's characterized by blood. Uh, you know that the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, particularly aspirin, you know they can wreak havoc on gastric mucosa as well because of non-selectivity of the COX inhibitors. You know that 
It's not surprising. We said that alcohol can do a lot of damage to the esophagus. It's probably the number one cause of gastric damage and inflammation as well. Smoking is on the list. I'm not just saying this to be prudish. Cigarette smoke is very, very much tied in with uh, chronic gastritis. We said chemotherapy in general can wreak havoc on the gastrointestinal system. We mentioned the esophagus, but the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine, they're not excluded. Uremia, for some reason I have never really quite understood, is associated with the gastritis. From the infectious point of view, salmonella can not only wreak, and CMV can not only wreak havoc on other places of the GI system, but they're at the top of the list for an infectious type of gastritis caused by the specific pathogens, in this case of bacteria, salmonella, or the most common virus, CMV. There is uh, the concept of stress gastritis, often the term stress ulcer is used as well. And the thing that is the common denominator for stress gastritis or stress ulcers is the fact that the body has undergone a lot of stress and is now releasing a, a massive amount of, uh, st of steroid hormones from the adrenal cortex. So could trauma be a cause? Yeah. Could burns be a cause? Could surgery be a cause? Yeah. These are also the kind of conditions which might give rise to things like uh, ARDS or uh, um, uh, DIC as well. Ischemia and shock. Patients that have been in shock uh, all very often have hemorrhages in the stomach. Uh, suicide attempts, people that have uh, drunk, once again, acids and alkali are damaging their gastric mucosa. I'm mentioning it, but it should not be unlogical. <clears throat> what about somebody that's had radiation that affected the stomach? Perhaps it's therapeutic or some type of freezing effect on the gastric mucosa? Yeah that would often very cause an acute type of gastritis as well. What about mechanical instrumentation? Very often patients that have had a lot of nasogastric tubes in their stomach will show up at autopsy as linear ulcers. So we see linear small ulcerations and hemorrhages in the gastric mucosa, and they're quite linear. You always assume that there was a nasogastric tube in there as well. And also patients that have had a distal gastrectomy for neoplasms or other reasons are much more likely to have inflammation in the rest of the stomach simply because they have lost a significant part of their acid neutralizing mucosa. So here's an acute gastritis characterized by hemorrhage. I bet if you look at this area, you can probably see some neutrophils, but hemorrhage is the main uh, component as well as erosions, um, there may be neutrophils in the inflammatory uh, reaction underneath. There also may be ulcerations as well, or probably a better term than a true ulcer would be a mucosal erosion. Now, what's the difference between an erosion and an ulcer? Probably not much, but when you talk about an erosion, it usually just refers to the very superficial mucosa. And an ulcer is something that is thought of as being a little bit more extensive, perhaps extending uh, further down. Okay, what about chronic gastritis? We said acute gastritis has hemorrhage. Chronic gastritis does not have hemorrhage. Uh, it does not have erosions. If anything that has erosions has hemorrhage. Why? Because there's loss of mucosa, that's why. The single most common cause of chronic gastritis is a little bug called Helicobacter pylori. It's also the single main cause of duodenal and gastric ulcers. It also causes a wide variety of neoplasm. H. pylori has been given a tremendous amount of interest in the past few years. But you can also have a chronic gastritis due to an autoimmune condition in which you're making antibodies against your gastric mucosa and elements of the gastric mucosa and also intrinsic factor, which is made by the gastric mucosa. And when you get a situation like that, and you're attacking your own gastric mucosa and areas which produce the intrinsic factor, you are then not able to handle vitamin B12 well. And even though you may be able to absorb it 
in your terminal ilium, it doesn't get there like it should be because it has not been properly handled with intrinsic factor. Uh, alcohol and cigarettes, again, chronic gastritis, we said it could cause ac acute and very more significant forms, but also chronic as well. What about if bile reflexes back into the stomach? Do you think that's a very significant cause? Antro, especially uh, gastritis? Absolutely. What about uh, technically mechanical irritations like foreign bodies or large impacting foreign bodies, which we call bezoitis? Uh, what about the, uh, uh, some kind of muscular problem of the stomach where it's just not peristalsing properly and it's more exposed to food and acid-like substances? Do you think that that might be a general pathophysiologic concept for a, a chronic gastritis? Absolutely. Radiation as well, just like with acute gastritis, and also granulomatous inflammations of the stomach. And we'll be learning that there is a disease that is often thought of as being sort of limited to the small bowel and large bowel called Crohn's disease, but it can also involve the stomach as well. So a granulomatous gastritis uh, classically could very easily be Crohn's disease or it could be tuberculosis or any other granulomatous inflammation. It could be sarcoid, it could be fungus. Once again, uh, graft versus host, like with acute, and also uremia. I never quite understood the relationship, but if somebody does, uh, that would be very nice to Google it or look it up and tell me why uremia might cause gastritis, because I can't understand the pathophysiologic concept. Okay, here we go again. And we're going to show you a classical and perhaps somewhat boring chronic gastritis because in it you don't see mucosal erosions and therefore you don't see hemorrhage but you do see in this lamina propria you know we have not breached the muscularis mucosa yet this is still the connective tissue of the mucosa infiltrates of what look like lymphocytes and even though at this power it, they just look like little black areas you know when we would zoom this up that these would be infiltrates of lymphocytes. Okay, and in fact, you may not only have in general increase in diffuse lymphocytes, but not also follicles, and not only primary follicles, but secondary follicles as well, the ones that have the lighter immunoblasts on the inside. Okay, do you think that a chronic gastritis might predispose to intestinal metaplasia, in which you have an intestinal type of epithelium in the stomach? Yeah. What about atrophy? Do you think that a gastritis, especially an autoimmune gastritis or something that's actually attacking or damaging the epithelial cells, do you think that that might result in mucosal hypoplasia as well? Yeah. Now here's the tricky question. And I can't really fully understand it, but also you have to remember that the conditions, all of the conditions which may result in gastric atrophy or mucosal hyperplasia may also predispose to dysplasia. So a lot of the gastric carcinomas are preceded by achlorhydria or decreased gastric acid. Just remember that. These are the changes that may be result from or secondary from general long-standing chronic gastritis, no matter what the causes are. And of course, this is a nice picture because after we go through this big differential diagnosis, we're showing you right now the single biggest cause of chronic gastritis. Here is a gastric mucosal mucus gland. Here is a special stain called the methanamine silver stain, and actually it's a stain for fungus, but it also stains this little bacteria very nicely that we call Helicobacter pylori. This is something that is going to really explode, and it has already, as being a cause of a lot of things. As you could guess, in fact, let me ask you this question. Let's say I ask you, do you think that Helicobacter pylori invades 
the gastric mucosa and goes through them? Or do you think it generally remains confined to the little slimy layer of mucus that's along the apical surface? Yeah, helicobacter is not invasive, but it certainly likes to colonize the surface of mucus here. And these are all helicobacter. There's about 150 of them here. And if you don't want to do this more sensitive stain, which is a little trickier to do, and you just want to do a regular Gimza type stain, which is easier to do. You can see those little buggers also right there and there and there and there and there, adhering to the uh, surface mucus of the mucus cells. And by the way, you don't see any of these, or very few perhaps, of these cells within the cells. So they do not generally invade the mucosal cells. That's the number one cause of chronic gastritis. About 10% of chronic gastritis is autoimmune. So do you think that there are uh, antibodies that your own body can produce against the actual enzymes uh, that produce the acid, like ATPase, potassium, or the gastrin receptor site, or the intrinsic factor? Absolutely. And these are truly autoimmune. They're listed with the classical autoimmune diseases. And not only would they produce achlorhydria, but they would also produce ultimately a pernicious or megaloblastic anemia because of the inability of intrinsic factor to operate on B12 in order to be absorbed in terminal ileum. You may have a perfectly normal terminal ileum, but if you don't have intrinsic factor, you can't absorb the B12. It's as simple as that. So here are all the places the antibodies can occur. And let's talk about some other general types of gastritis. I'm not going to go into them. Some of them are sort of uh, can be characterized as little scenarios. But let's just say there is a relatively common condition called eosinophilic gastritis. And it's not hard to diagnose because you just look at the gastric mucosa from the biopsy. You see a lot of eosinophils, and if it is not an allergic or an obvious allergic etiology, it's very often a middle-aged woman. The allergic type of eosinophilic gastritis is usually seen in children, but pathologically, you might not be able to tell the difference between that and eosinophilic, except for the uh, profiling of the patient. If you saw a primarily whopping infiltrate of lymphocytes causing an inflammation, which of course they could do in any case. Uh, generally speaking, uh, there could be T cells and it's usually a very diffuse, significant infiltrate. That's lymphocytic gastritis. What if you saw granulomas in the gastric mucosa or even deeper? Because we're gonna learn later on, perhaps the next session, that Crohn's disease not only involves the mucosa, but it also involves the deeper layers. All layers, as a matter of fact, of the large bowel and small bowel, but it can also involve the stomach as well. In fact, that's one of the things that differentiates it from ulcerative colitis. Not only are there granulomas differentiated, but the fact is ulcerative colitis only involves large bowel. Crohn's disease can go the entire GI tract. It's even been reported to involve oral cavity as well. And remember, we said that in a graft versus host reaction, you can see in bone marrow transplants, you can see a picture of uh, chronic gastritis as well. Very common. I'm going to show you a picture now. I'm not happy with the way it turned out, but here is a stomach. You can see that not only this the muscular layer, but you can see it's infiltrated by a bunch of inflammatory types of cells. And this is something that looks a little more superficial. And I wish it was a better picture, but if you are, have good eyes, and you look at that cell, 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 you might think, you know, these don't look like regular old neutrophils. I think a lot of these are eosinophils. I wish I had a better picture of it. Next time I will, but this is an eosinophilic gastritis. So that's the world's easiest diagnosis. Now, let's talk about the concept of something we've been skirting around We'll talk about true peptic ulcers. A peptic ulcer is an ulcer anywhere 
in the GI tract that has been caused by the acid uh, destruction of the mucosa. So if you have any failure in the acid control at any of the levels we talked about, you can get peptic ulcers. You can get peptic ulcers in the stomach. You can get peptic ulcers in the duodenum. Those are the two most common places. And remember, we talked about in a lot of the acute hemorrhagic gastritis, we'll talk about mucosal erosions, but a peptic ulcer is usually a solitary and deeper thing. You don't want to always equate the word erosion with ulcer. And the more severe the ulcer gets, the more likely it is to involve the mucosa, the submucosa, the muscularis, and even the serosa. And then very often in a lot of the large ulcers, you just have a very thin uh, wall between the lumen of the stomach and the abdominal cavity. It may be a fibrous wall if it's a chronic ulcer, or it may be a fibrinous wall if it's an acute ulcer. And if it's a fibrinous wall and it's acute, you're probably thinking, well, that's probably at high risk for perforation. Okay, most of the peptic ulcers are caused by H. pylori. In the older days, there was a lot of surgery for peptic ulcers, and now most of them are treated, whether they're in the duodenum or the stomach, by antibiotics, which are generally effective against H. pylori. And not only are 80% of the ulcers of the stomach, the peptic acid ulcers, caused by H. pylori, but you want to hear another interesting statistic? In the duodenum, 100% of the peptic ulcers are caused by H. pylori. You know that you can have uh, NSAIDs that's causing an ulcer as well. Just like we said, NSAIDs can cause an acute gastritis. We said stress can cause an acute gastritis where there's gastric erosions. Well, they can also cause larger ulcers as well. So don't forget that. And that's probably the main reason why this whole multi-billion dollar uh, industry of Cox selective inhibitors, you know, has um, invaded our country. Um, let's talk about helicobacter, because we said it already causes 80% of them. We also caused 100% the duodenal peptic ulcers. We also it was the main cause of chronic gastritis. Guess what else it causes? It's very, very highly linked as a direct causative factor to gastric adenocarcinomas as well. Now, you want to know another thing? It also causes the malt lymphomas. Remember, we said that there is probably just as much mucosal associated lymphoid tissue or malt throughout the entire GI tract as there are in the lymph nodes that drain the GI tract, believe it or not. So you're just as likely to get a lymphoma from malt tissue in the GI tract as you are from the lymph nodes external to the tubular structures. So remember this, and that's why it's in yellow. It causes most of the cancers of the stomach. It causes all of the malt lymphomas of the GI tract. It's the main cause of chronic gastritis and causes almost all of the gastric and duodenal ulcers. Keep that in mind for H. pylori. It's something that nobody would have ever thought of 20 years ago. And now the stuff coming out with helicobacter is, is voluminous. So symptomatically, peptic ulcer, you might have a burning or gnawing feeling. It's in the true epigastric area. It's not usually extremely localized. That type of pain is usually generally vague and epigastric. If the patient's been losing enough blood, it may be iron deficiency anemia, which of course is the number one cause of anemia in older patients, no matter what is uh, um, occult GI blood loss, whether it's stomach or intestine. A peptic ulcer can bleed acutely. In a relatively small number of cases, it can bleed acutely and kill you as well. It has about 20% mortality of acute hemorrhage from peptic ulcer. Uh, depending on where it is, and the, you can have a feel referred pain if it penetrates or perforates through the stomach. You can feel pain in the back, not just epigastric, pain in the chest, and not just the epigastric area, but the left upper quadrant as well. So the deeper and more likely the ulcer is to perforate, 
the more likely you are to feel it other places than just your classical epigastric pain. Now, here's the thing. Peptic ulcers by themselves are not felt to be malignant or develop into malignancy. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, if you just told us that most peptic ulcers are caused by helicobacter and most uh, adenocarcinoma of the stomach are caused by helicobacter, don't you think you should really modify that last statement here? I guess I could. But just remember, when you examine a true peptic ulcer, uh, you are not going to find pre-malignant changes in general. So a benign ulcer is a benign ulcer, and a malignant ulcer is a malignant ulcer. Let's just keep it at that. Okay. We said that with the bleeding of a peptic ulcer, it occurs in a pretty good number of patients. It doesn't have to bleed, but often it does. It's the single most frequent complication. It can be life-threatening. In about 20%, 25% of the patients who die of peptic ulcers die because of the bleeding. And the bleeding may be the first indication of an ulcer, even before the epigastric pain or the complications of the perforation. Now, if it perforates, which it does in only about 5%, thank God, it has a very high mortality. So a perforated peptic ulcer is a life-threatening event, but very, very rarely is it the first symptom of an ulcer. If an ulcer penetrates, chances are for a long time, perhaps months or years, even before it's penetrated, you've had other symptoms, not just bleeding, not just pain, but a perforated ulcer is very, very rarely the first indication of the ulcer. Now, if the ulcer has been there for a long time and there's been a lot of inflammation and there's been a lot of scarring, could you then have what we would call the pyloric channel ulcer in which you have a lot of fibrosis and therefore perhaps even an obstruction, just like we saw with true pyloric stenosis of the congenital type? And yeah, you can. And if you thought that a significant edema and scarring is occurring in the pyloric region of the stomach, do you think that that might also be associated with ulcers in the duodenum as well? And if they were, do you think it's all helicobacter? And of course, the answer is yes. So these are the general uh, consequences of bleeding, perforation, and obstruction, some of the factors behind them. The acute ulcers of the stomach, you could put at the top of the list the most common thing, the same thing that one of the most commonest things for acute gastritis, and that's NSAIDs. You also have to understand that there is a concept of stress ulcer, and let's make this very simple. If you have an increase in either endogenous corticosteroids or exogenous corticosteroids, you're at risk for a stomach ulcer. Remember, that was like one of the big symptoms of too much steroids was a gastric ulcer. Well, what if the steroids were not increased extrinsically or exogenously, but they're increased intrinsically, like your steroids are increased in shock, massive trauma, burns. There's also a concept of what they call a Cushing ulcer, and for a lot of people, they think a Cushing ulcer may be due to increased uh, uh, exogenous steroids. But a Cushing ulcer is actually an ulcer of the stomach that's associated with increased intracranial pressure as well. So people that have intracranial trauma, they may have elevated steroids as well because it's all part of this significant shock burns trauma picture. But if they wind up having a ulcer of the stomach, it's called a Cushing ulcer. And of course, sepsis has to be thrown in. So basically, we're talking about patients with very, very significant life-threatening conditions in which there is a massive pumping out of steroids associated with acute ulcers. So when we do autopsies on patients that die after significant uh, amounts of shock or sepsis or trauma, you know we're probably going to see some gastric hemorrhages of gastric ulcers as well. And of course, if those little hemorrhages or ulcers are linear, we're going to think it's probably secondary to uh, being intubated. Here's some gastric uh, mucosa that's been opened, and they're relatively small. 
And uh, because these are generally can be to all of the conditions we just talked about. The acute ulcers are generally small. They're generally uh, less than a centimeter. They're usually multiple. But let me ask you a question. Let's say that all of these little ulcerations or hemorrhages were gone. And all you had was this linear array of four, five, six, seven hemorrhages along the straight line. Well, then you automatically assume that's from uh, intubation. That's very, very, very common to see at autopsy. Let's talk about gastric dilatation. Okay, your stomach is distended. Why is it distended? Well, there may be pyloric stenosis of the congenital variety or of the of one that's caused by extensive uh, ulcerations. If there is a peritonitis in your abdominal cavity, the general rule is that it generally slows down or stops peristalsis in your stomach. So gastric dilatation is very, very commonly associated with abdominal peritonitis. Now, if we told you that the normal range of volume of the stomach is about, let's say, one and a half to three liters, we'll say two liters as an average, we talk about distended stomachs, we're talking about several times that amount. Your stomach can probably hold two or three times that amount without being life-threatening. But if it's about 10 liters or more, you're at very, very significant risk for acute rupture. So acute rupture of a stomach due to gastric dilatation from any cause, as you would guess, has a very high immediate mortality rate. And of course, if it was distended due to peritonitis already, there may have already been cycled some type of rupture in your GI wall somewhere else, correct? Another common uh, thing that we often see presented at Grand Rounds as kind of interesting things is the concept of a bezoar. Now, if you have a cat and it throws up a hairball, I think you already know what a bezoar is. It's the presence of foreign material, non-digestible material, that can distend the stomach. And not only can it distend the stomach, but it can make a little cast of itself. So a lot of times if your cat has a significant hairball and it throws it up, it may be, you know, almost in the shape of the cat's little stomach. If it's a due to plant material for whatever reason, like my dog loves to eat grass, then you call it a phytobezoar. If it's due to hair, it's called a trichobezoar because trico is the root word for hair and phyto is the root word for plant. You know, patients, uh, especially psych patients, can eat a lot of crazy things. And I'm telling you, all of these things have been described as being in gastric bezoars, which can cause significant mucosal damage, significant obstruction, and with enough of volume, also wind up being a cast of the stomach. Believe it or not, things like pins, nails. How do you like this one? Razor blades, coins, gloves. These are not the kinds of things that generally normal people would like to eat. So you could generally guess what kinds of patients have stuff like this. Here's a phyto, I'm sorry, this looks like it's a trichobezoar because if you look at it, it, you can see here. And this filled up the entire stomach and I guess it was taken out at surgery. Now, I'm guessing this was a human I don't know, I can't remember where it's from, but it doesn't really matter. This bezoar is in the shape of the stomach. There's the lesser curvature, there's the greater curvature. So, so much for a bezoar. Let's talk about the concept of hypertrophic gastropathy now. Often the term hypertrophic gastritis is used and it's actually a double misnomer because even the, the word hypertrophy, if you remember from our classical definition, occurs to increase in size of the individual cells. Almost all of these so-called, quote, hypertrophic gastropathies or gastritis are not due to increase in size of the mucosal cells. They're due to increased numbers. So hypertrophic gastropathies should really be called hyperplastic gastropathies, but for some classical reason, they're not. They're more like they be called hypertrophic. And if you Google the term hypertrophic gastropathy, I bet you it's 10 times as common as 
hyperplastic gastropathy. But think about it. If you have an increased number of mucosal cells, uh, you're going to probably wind up also having rugal prominence because the rugae, the submucosal extensions, are a way of increasing surface area. The hypertrophic gastropathies usually do not have much inflammation. So that's another reason why the term hypertrophic gastritis would be a double a misnomer rather than a single misnomer. And the, the chief feature of all of the hypertrophic gastropathies, I'm going to show you three examples, is hyperplasia of the mucosa. It could be the surface mucus epithelium. It could be the deeper acid portion, but it's generally a hyperplasia without inflammation. So, we already said that hypertrophic gastritis is a double misnomer, and the word hyperplastic gastropathy would be the best term. There's a, a condition called Menetrier's disease, and in Menetrier's disease, you see hyperplasia primarily of the surface mucus cells rather than the acid-producing cells, and they're generally associated with things like infections, like CMV or H. pylori, or even there's even a condition in which transforming growth factor alpha is elevated in these uh, conditions. Now, let's say that you have the type of hyperplastic gastropathy in which you have increased acid as well. Well, that means you also have hyperplasia of the parietal cells, correct? Now, there's two types for that. There's one in which you have hyperplasia of the parietal and sheath cells, not just the surface mucosal cells, with normal gastrin, okay? So these, this hyperplasia is not due to increased gastrin. But in the other kind, you have hyperplasia of the acid cells and the chief cells because of a gastrinoma or a tumor that produces a gastrin or gastrin-like substance. And that's called zollinger ellison syndrome. So when you have a, uh, a neuroendocrine tumor, very often of the GI tract but, or the lungs, it could be in a wide variety of places. In any tumor that produces increased gastrin as a perineoplastic syndrome and results in increased stomach acid, because of the increased gastrin, is called zollinger ellison syndrome. And you'll probably see cases like that presented every now and then at grand rounds because it's an interesting thing to do. Now, here is hypertrophic gastroscopy from the view of an endoscopist. And you can see the rugae, which normally do not look this big and prominent, are very prominent. Now, here's another endoscopist view in which you can see uh, the rugae are so prominent, it looks like there's big worms crawling in the submucosa, or somebody stuck, or gigantic varices, for example. But these are just very prominent rugae because you have hyperplastic mucosa. Here you are from the radiologist's point of view, and you can actually see in here that these giant rugae are actually causing little crevices where they can see the barium dripping through. And normally you don't get this much of a a, a pattern. So a radiologist will tell you if these are prominent rugae. Here you are from the pathologist's point of view. It doesn't look like a relatively flat gastric mucosa. It looks very, very what we would call cerebrated, you know, like uh, gyri and sulci in the brain. Here's another cerebrated view from the point of view of pathologist down here in the southeast. And here we go under the microscope you could see that there is a true hyperplasia of the cells. Now, if you remember, when we showed you the pictures of the stomach, we showed you the mucosa and the pits and the glands, we did not have this much mucosa. This is a very, very, very increased amount of mucosa, okay? And remember, if only the surface mucosa is primarily increased, that could be menetriase. If the uh, acid-producing cells are increased, but there's no increased gastrin, that's another possible uh, syndrome. But if the gas, uh, acid-producing cells are increased due to a gastrin tumor, that type of hyperplastic gastropathy is called Zollinger-Ellison syndrome. And as you might guess, 
in the types of hypertrophic gastropathy in which the parietal cells are also hyperplaced, do you think that patient would also have a lot of ulcers? Absolutely. Okay. Let's talk about, where are we, by the way? What, what time is it? Do I read near the end or should I keep going? Yeah, let's take a few more topics here because I think we're almost near the end of a stomach except for maybe tumors. So let's talk about varices. And there's really not much uh, that we can say about gastric varices that weren't true with esophageal varices. You know, you know that the uh, all of the venous drainage of the stomach is portal. And, you know, most of the venous drainage throughout the lower esophagus is portal. So we talked about esophageal varices secondary to portal hypertension. That was easy to understand. But it's just as easy to understand in the stomach, too. Because if your uh, varices, your submucosal veins, are subject to increased pressure, like cirrhosis with portal hypertension, you know, they might look like prominent rugae. Here's something that looks like a prominent rugae, but it's a distended submucosal blood. Okay? Now, here's the principle. You always hear about gastric, uh, you always hear about esophageal varices as being a significant fear of a cirrhotic patient, but you don't usually hear about gastric varices. So here's the rule. Uh, in general, esophageal varices are more common than gastric varices in cirrhosis. But if a patient has gastric varices, most likely he has esophageal as well. So if he has esophageal, most likely he does not have gastric. But generally they go hand in hand from the same pathophysiologic process. And here you are looking at it from the point of view of a gastroscopist. And I don't know, to me this looks like an autopsy specimen. Although in the autopsy specimen, you wouldn't expect these to be prominent anymore because the large venous sinuses have now collapsed, haven't they? And leads us to the very last concept of gastric tumors. And I think we'll cover the majority of gastric tumors uh, on uh, the next session because we've covered a lot today. But I want to give you a little introduction, and it's generally the same type of introduction we talked about with esophageal tumors. And as you know, the classification of all tumors, the basic classification, is benign, whether the growth is limited and encapsulated, or whether it's malignant, whether it's invasive and metastatic. So once again, you go back to the histology, and you look at all the cells that compromise the stomach, smooth muscle, glandular cells, uh, Fat. These are all normal things, uh, glandular epithelium. And you say, well, probably proliferations of these are the same as the classification of gastric tumors. That's true. So if a lyomyoma of the stomach is derived from the smooth muscle, could it be a lyomyosarcoma? Yes, but not nearly as common as a regular old lyomyoma. What about fat? Is there fat? in and around the stomach, yeah. So if you have a lipoma of the stomach, could that lipoma protrude into the lumen of the stomach? Yeah, and if it did, would, might it look like a polyp? Absolutely. What about malignancies of the stomach? Do you think that squamous cell carcinomas of the stomach are common malignancies? That's a question, by the way. And I think you'll know the answer. Everybody knows it's no, because you don't normally have squamous mucosa in the stomach. So if you have a tumor of the stomach that also has some squamous epithelium in it, most likely it's metaplastic epithelium, and most likely it's not malignant. Now, do you think that if a malignant lymphoma of the stomach arose, it would arise from the parts of the stomach that have lymphoid tissue, what we call malt? You mean mucosal associated lymphoid tissue, which means either in the lamina propria or the submucosa. Yeah, so most of the gastric lymphomas arise from where you have the lymphoid tissue in the stomach. Now, a third classification of gastroid tumors, which has become very interesting now that we have ways of identifying antigens better, is a so-called GIST tumor. And I guarantee you, you'll hear of GIST tumors. 
you know, maybe even on the boards or whatever, but just tumor because it's very trendy these days. And that stands for gastrointestinal stromal tumor. And, and like the lyomyoma, it generally looks like connective tissue, spindly and smooth muscle. But it's going to wind up having uh, very special little markers, which means it's more of neural type origin rather than classical smooth muscle origin. And last but not least, we have another potentially malignant tumor called the carcinoid. We talked about carcinoids in the lung. You can have carcinoid in anywhere in the GI tract. And the carcinoid tumor is a tumor of neuroendocrine cells. And the gastric carcinoids, of course, are always potentially malignant. So nobody would ever sign out a uh, carcinoid of the stomach as benign and malignant. They just call it carcinoid because even the benign appearing ones could metastasize. Now, let me ask you this. Let's say that a carcinoid tumor is removed from the stomach, but the patient also has carcinoid syndrome after you remove it. Do you think it's probably already metastasized to the liver? That's a question. Yeah, and let me ask you another question. Do you think the primary site for metastasis of any gastrointestinal malignant tumor would be liver? Yeah, because the liver is like the big vein or the big lymph node for the entire GI system because it's all poor. So any tumor that appears in a portal vein or any vein has to go to the liver. There are not any systemic or caval veins in your GI organs, right? They're all 100% portal. So that's why the liver is the first site of all gastrointestinal metastases. Okay, we've made these introductory statements, uh, but the last thing I want to say, and I've kind of skirted around it, is that 99% of the tumors of the stomach are going to be looked at by the GI doctor and you and the pathologist as being mucosal projections, and those are called polyps. So remember, any tumor that projects into the lumen, which could be seen with the endoscope, or radiologically, or pathologically, is classified as a polyp. The polyp could be hyperplastic, which means it's never going to be malignant because it's just a hyperplasia of the normal cells. Or it could be adenomatous. And there's some of the adenomatous, a relatively low percentage, may turn into malignancies. Or it could just be downright malignant in the first place as well. Okay, so we'll just call it a day today because I think we made a good introduction into gastric tumors. So what we'll do in the next session, you know, in five days minus two hours, we'll finish the discussion on gastric tumors, which is, by the way, very logical and short, and then probably, possibly finish the entire discussion on large and small bowel, which is, of course, bigger than stomach and bigger than esophagus. So we know exactly what we'll be doing in the next session. And I, I see a question here, and I think somebody looked up my uh, answer. So I want to tell you, one of your students here, I don't know his name, and I don't care, he's helped elucidate one of my uh, questions. And let's see if somebody said, Okay, hold on. Somebody said, a disease in cell-mediated immunity in uremia associated with an increase in suppressor cells. Okay, well, that's an article that somebody gave me, and it implies that in uremia, there is an immune defect, probably uh, in T cells, which might be the explanation for gastritis in uremia patients. Now, I see another patient has asked a question as well. So we'll take that question. And somebody asked, do you or anybody else have any idea how to record your presentation, which free software is used? Well, I use Camtasia, okay? And my plea to you is that if anybody has recorded it, you know, and I know that one guy named John said he recorded the second half, so we'll maybe be able to salvage that. But I use Camtasia, but unfortunately, Camtasia did not work uh, with my laptop in Vero Beach. 
It always works with my desktop in Chicago, however. It also didn't work with a laptop in Las Vegas either. Now, somebody says, slide 228 shows submucous glands in the esophagus. How do they drain the mucus via squamous layer? Oh, it's very easy. When you see a little cluster of mucus glands in the submucosa of the esophagus, there's usually a tiny little duct that goes to the surface. In fact, in one of those slides, or if you look back at slide 28, you might even see that little duct. It's between the cluster of glands and the squamous epithelium. Now, somebody else says, slide 32 shows eosinophilic intranuclear inclusions. So, most intranuclear inclusions are acetic and only CMV showing basophilic. Well, that's kind of true. But here, let's make this simple. If you have a virally infected cell of the herpes family and it produces a acetophilic intranuclear inclusion, it's likely to be herpes simplex. If you have a virally infected cell of the herpes family, which produces a much more basophilic intranuclear inclusion, it's much more likely to be CMV. That's the general principle. And here, I'll make it simpler. It's something you can remember, because I remembered it my whole life. Any basophilic intranuclear inclusion in an infected cell is regarded to be CMV until proven otherwise. Okay, thank you. I've commented and answered all the questions. Thank you very much for your help with the uremia thing. And you know you're going to hear my favorite ABBA song now, right? Yes, you are. And as long as I could close this thing, we're going to start it. See you in five days, folks. And it was really a lot of fun today. And even though I'm on the road and I don't feel as much security on the road as I do when I'm at home, I think it was a good day. And I know I was at least able to record this from uh, the lower resolution WMV from webinar. So we'll include uh, Abba's last song, Chiquita, on that as well. See you in a few days.